Ladies and gentlemen, join with me in giving Brigitte Gabriel a big Idaho welcome. inviting me to your community. Thank you for having me here. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here. I've been waiting to get here for the last two months since we knew I was going to be coming here and speaking, and I've been counting the days. I came to Idaho the first time last year, and I left my heart here. So I am so glad to be back here. You know, people ask me all the time, Brigitte, don't you get depressed talking about terrorism and radical Islam and national security? How can you sleep at night? I tell them, of course I get down. I'm a human just like you. But what keeps me so energized is when I travel across this amazing country of ours and I meet wonderful patriots like you who take the time out of your busy schedule to come here and be with me because you love this country as much as I do and you want to learn how we can protect it together. You are truly the wind beneath my wings. You are the energy that drives me to do this over and over and over again. So thank you for honoring me with your presence. Obviously, we are here, all of us tonight, because we are concerned about that changes happening all over our country. All of us know something is not right with our country. There are a lot of changes around us. There's a lot of radicalism and a lot of hatred rising all throughout the world. People who hate us so much, they want our destruction. Radical Islam is rising worldwide. And radical Islam is bent on attacking Western civilization and especially America as the bullseye. The national security issue is an American issue. It's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democratic issue, it's not a Libertarian issue, it's an American issue. Radical Islam has declared war on America and attacked America for the last 30, 40 years, regardless who we had as president in the White House, whether it was a Republican or a Democrat. Radical Islam attacked America the first time in 1979 with the hostages in Iran. We had Jimmy Carter as president, a Democrat. America was attacked again in 1983 in Lebanon with the killings of the Marines in Lebanon under President Ronald Reagan, a Republican. America was attacked again under George Bush senior administration. America was attacked again under the Clinton administration. It was actually under President Clinton, a Democrat, where the World Trade Center was attacked the first time in 1993. It was also under President Clinton that the Taliban's trained 10,000 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Those people were not being trained for entertainment. They were being trained to attack the United States of America. At that time, George Bush Jr. and Dick Cheney were not even a blurb on the political American landscape. And America was attacked again under George Bush in 2001. And people thought, if we just get rid of President Bush and elect President Obama, all our sins are going to be forgiven. The whole world is going to sing Kumbaya. The Muslims are going to fall in love with us. Obviously, that did not happen. Two days after President Obama became president, Al-Qaeda issued a press release saying, we continue our jihad against the United States, regardless who sits in the White House. And since President Obama became president, in the first four years of his presidency, we have arrested on American soil 226 homegrown terrorists, 186 of them were Muslims. Now we have a problem in our country when a faith-based group that accounts for less than 2% of the American population 
is responsible for over 80% of terrorist attacks and plots against the United States. That's a reality we have to deal with as a nation. This is a fact. This is not the opinion of Brigitte Gabriel. And that's why we need to come together. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about the national security issue and protecting our nation. And the reason why I'm passionate about it, it's because it affected my life personally. You see, I was born and raised in Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We had open border policy. We welcomed everybody into our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Arabic Islamic Middle East. Muslims used to send their children to our country to study in our universities. They graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy in, the in, in, uh, in Lebanon, in the Middle East, even though we did not have any oil. Beirut became Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. Actually, National Geographic magazine in 1965 had on its front cover Lebanon, Eden of the Middle East. And fortunately, all that began to change as the population began to shift in the country. That's when we started accepting waves of Palestinian refugees into the country because we were so open-hearted, we wanted to take them in and help them out. We ended up accepting a third wave of Palestinian refugees in the 70s, even though their own Arab brethren did not want them. Lebanon welcomed them because we had a good economy, we had good jobs, we even did not have the space but we were willing to take them because according to our Judeo-Christian values, especially with Lebanon being majority Christians, we wanted to help them out. Once they became the majority in Lebanon, because Lebanon is a very small country, that's when the war started. The all-out start of the Lebanese war happened in 1975 when a Palestinian Muslim refugee walked into a church in Beirut on a Sunday morning and started firing at worshipers, killing four and injuring 100. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975, when radical Islamists blew up my home, bringing it down, burying, it up, burying me under the rebel wounded as they shouted, Allahu Akbar. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months. And as I laid in a hospital bed, hooked up to IVs in both arms, going from one surgery to another, I would ask my parents, why did they do this to us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians, the Muslims consider us infidels, and they want to kill us. So I learned since I was a 10-year-old little girl that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith and lived in a Christian town. I ended up leaving the hospital and coming back home, but my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living in a bomb shelter underground in an eight by 10 room without electricity, without water, and very little food. To get some food, we would crawl out under the bombs and we would dig out dandelions and different vegetation that grew around our bomb shelter because it was the only greenery we had to eat. To get some water, we would crawl under sniper's bullets to a nearby spring to get some water. And every time before we, said, before we left the bomb shelter to go to the spring, we would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to come back alive or dead just to get a drink of water. What used to take a five-minute walk would take us hours crawling in a ditch. And when we would get to the spring, my mother had to use her stocking on top of the gallon of water to catch all the dirt and all the junk so we can drink the water. And this became my existence. We lived in the mountains. In the winter time, it was very cold and we didn't have any heat. My father would go out of our bomb shelter and break twigs from the trees that grew around and he would bring them into the bomb shelter and he would pour kerosene or benzene on, on the woods and he would light a fire and we would all huddle around the fire. And many nights we had an agreement 
that whoever woke up first, because many nights we would fall asleep around the fire, that whoever woke up first in the middle of the night would drag the other two outside, because we were three of us living in the bomb shelter, and slap them on their face to wake up, because many nights we would pass out because of carbon monoxide poisoning. We had no ventilation. This became my existence. We were surrounded to be slaughtered and we knew what our fate was going to be because we heard stories from those who escaped and came to our town about the massacres that were being committed by those we have taken in, the Palestinian refugees and the Islamists in our country. They would surround Christian villages in Beirut, one of the most famous uh, Christian city that was massacred was the city of the Moor, where they went in, they would find a mother and a father hiding with a little baby in a bomb shelter. They would take the baby, tie one leg of the baby to the mother and another leg to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They would walk into our churches, urinate and defecate on the altar using the Bible as toilet paper and then torch our churches. The last lady that worked for me when I was an adult, I hired her so I can take care of her because she was mentally disturbed. And the reason why she was mentally disturbed is because they walked into her bomb shelter. They found her with her family hiding. They took her 16-year-old son, tied him on her lap, held the knife to her hand and made her slit her own son's throat and then raped her two daughters in front of her. As ugly and uncomfortable these stories are, we must hear them to understand the barbarity that is heading our way. Somehow we have become desensitized when we hear the stories on television about what ISIS is doing, as if this is a new phenomenon. This has just started happening now. Not where I come from. It started happening in the 70s. We lived in the bomb shelter for three years. My father, in the beginning, my father would say, the world is going to wake up and see what's happening to the Christians in Lebanon, and they're going to come save us. America is going to come. Britain is going to come. France is going to come. Australia is going to come. Canada is going to come. And nobody came, and nobody cared. I remember three years into the ordeal, I was 13 years old. A friend of ours stopped by and he said, Brigitte, I just want you to know that we heard a lot of chatters on the radios today and we believe we're going to be attacked. And if we, I don't see you tomorrow, I wish you a merciful death. And he gave me a hug and he left. And I remember at the age of 13, dressing in my Sunday best, my Easter dress, because I wanted to look pretty when I am dead, knowing that when they come to slaughter me, there would be no one to bury me. And I sobbed, begging my mother, I don't want to die, please do something, I don't want to die. As my mother combed my long black hair down to my hips and tied the white ribbon in my hair that matched the white daisies in my blue dress. Sobbing, I don't want to die, I'm only 13. And there was nothing she could say to me. And I remember sitting in the corner of our bomb shelter, my mother, my father, and I, holding hands, and my father started reading from Psalms, I shall walk into the valley of death and fear no evil, for thou art with me. And my parents said to me, when they come to slaughter us tonight, we will create a distraction. We want you to run away, run as far as you can, run towards the Israeli border and never look back. You see, we lived five kilometers away from the Israeli border, two and a half miles. And we knew if we go to the Jews and beg for help, the Jews are not going to slaughter us because we had more shared values with them than we had with the Muslims. Thank God I did not have to make that difficult decision that night because that's the night Israel came in physically into Lebanon and set up artillery bases around our town to protect us from the Islamists who were attacking our towns. And this is how we went on living for another five years in the bomb shelter until 1982. And in 1982, Israel, working with the Christians, trying to help the Christians take back their democracy and kick out the radical Islamic elements that had taken control of the country at the time. Because by 1982, we had 11 Islamic terrorist organizations operating out of Lebanon, including the PLO. And Israel came in and push the Palestinians and the, and, and the Islamists away from our towns. And that's how we came out of the bomb shelter and back to rebuilding our lives. 
Little did I know at that time that I'm going to learn a lot about Islamic terrorism and what was happening. I ended up moving to Israel and becoming news anchor for World News in the Middle East between 1984 and 1989, covering world events. I lived in Jerusalem. And as I read the news night after night, I started realizing that there was a pattern developing. And this is when we started seeing a rise of terrorist activities all over the globe in the 80s. And I started realizing that there was a pattern developing. Because no matter where the terrorist activity took place, no matter what country, no matter on what continent, the name of the perpetrators were always the same. Muslims, Ahmed, Muhammad, Hussein, Ali. The name of the victims were always Westerners, Christians and Jews. Terry Waite, Terry Anderson, Colonel Higgins, the Achille Lauro, the TWA flights, the Panam flights, and I can go on and on. And what I started realizing, that what I used to think was a regional problem between a majority Muslim Middle East trying to either kill or expel the minority Christians and Jews had become a worldwide problem. But the world was not paying attention. The world was not connecting the dots. And isn't this exactly what the 9-11 Commission report said to us after 9-11? We lacked imagination. It's not that we did not know that Al-Qaeda wanted to attack the United States. After all, they attacked us the first time. In 1993, they attacked the World Trade Center. The only difference between the attacks of 1993 and 2001 is the buildings did not come down. They attacked the Kubar Towers in 1995. They attacked our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1997. They attacked the USS Call in 2000. And then they were so confident that we were so apathetic and so asleep that they came back and re-attacked the World Trade Center, the exact same location they attacked the first time in 1993. And this time, bringing the buildings down, killing almost 3,000 Americans and bringing America down to its knees. And they also attacked. We lacked imagination. So today, there is no excuse for us to say, we lack imagination. We don't think they're going to do this. We don't think they're going to do that. Just look at what's happening in the world. You see, my past is America's future unless America wakes up today and changes course. Just look at Europe and what is happening in Europe. Little did I know in 1982, as I was coming out of my bomb shelter, that, the, that my nightmare was not ending, but it was actually starting as the radical Islamists were feeling so empowered that they actually that year wrote a plan, a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on earth. In the counter-terrorism circles, this plan became known as the project, the Muslim Brotherhood Project. The Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest Islamic terrorist organization in the world, founded in 1928 in Egypt, and has 70 offshoot Islamic organizations around the world, including Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and now ISIS. The leader of ISIS, al-Baghdadi, was in our prisons in 2011 as a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. Al-Baghdadi today is the Khalif of ISIS and the head of ISIS worldwide. The Muslim Brotherhood, two things, in the, in, the, in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, scholars all throughout the world thought there is no way Islamic, the Islamic State could be resurrected because the Islamic State ended in 1924 in Turkey by President Ataturk after ruling for 1400 years. All the Western scholars thought Islam is over, it's not going to be resurrected, the Islamic Caliphate is finished. But two things happened in the last century that gave the Islamists the power and the money to organize. The first thing that happened was the discovery of oil in the Middle East, which we discovered and we were stupid enough to, to allow them to nationalize it. 
That gave them the money to expand their radical ideology worldwide. The second thing that happened was Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power in 1979. Now they had the spiritual covering. So now they have the money and the spiritual covering and they exploded on the world stage by 1982. In 1982, they wrote the plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on earth. What makes the plan, the project, which became known as the Muslim Brotherhood Project, so unique is it gives tactics and proposals as to how to infiltrate the West, how to use our laws against us, how to use our open-mindedness against us, how to use our multiculturalism against us. They give buzzwords that, that Islamists can use to disarm us, buzzwords such as, such as diversity, multiculturalism, interfaith, dialogue. Does this name sound familiar? Does this word sound familiar? They say if you use these words, you'll have Westerners lapping from the palm of your hands like dogs. They talk about how to set up nonprofit organizations and human rights organizations and maintain the appearance of moderation in order to advance the radical Islamic agenda in the West. They talk about how to get democratically elected Muslims on all levels in the West so they can influence policy. They talk about how to get Muslim interns in all governmental offices in the West so they can have an insider view as to how policy is done on the highest levels. They talk about how to build community centers within the inner cities and use them as recruiting places to recruit for the cause. They talk about how to work with like-minded, progressive organizations that share similar goals. This is why when you see the ACLU working with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Organization, uh, Relations, or any other leftist organization, you scratch your head and you think to yourself, what do these two have anything in common? But the leftist organizations are being used as the useful idiots, as a part of a plan in order to advance a radical Islamic agenda in the West. But they do not know what's going on. So why should we be concerned about that? because they wrote the plan for the destruction of the United States in 1991 as the American version of their plan. Now, when they started implementing their plan in Europe, remember they wrote the plan in 1982, by the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and the first part of this decade, Europe has morphed from Europe to Arabia. Europe is no longer the Europe that you used to go visit. It has been transformed. In France alone, there are over 725 no-go zones where the police is even scared to enter. In England, there are 85 Sharia courts operating parallel to British courts, completely different legal system. What's happening in Europe is a preview as to what's coming to the United States. They began enforcing their plan in Europe, and in 1991, they wrote the plan for the destruction of the United States. The plan for the destruction of the United States, this plan, was presented as evidence in the largest terrorism trial ever in the history of the United States, where our government handed down 108 guilty verdicts to Muslim Americans and Muslim American organizations raising money in America and sending it overseas to the tune of millions to support terrorist organizations overseas. Here is the plan, and you'll understand why the plan matters. This plan is titled مذكرة تفسيرية للهدف الاستراتيجي العام للجماعة في أمريكا الشمالية. You all got that? <laughs> I was going to read it to you in Arabic, but I thought the first page will suffice. I'll begin using it in English. The plan is titled an explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America written 5-22-1991. And I'm going to read you a few paragraphs out of this plan to show you what exactly they mean. You see, while we were operating blind and we are still operating blind and not know what on earth is going on around us, our enemy is working off of a plan. They know exactly where they're going. They have their roadmap. They already established the Islamic State. 
The Islamic State has been resurrected. Remember their goal was the establishment of the Islamic State? They already did that. They wrote their plan for world domination in 1982, and they established the Islamic State in 2013. They did it within 35, 40 years. And they are almost halfway into their 100-year plan to dominate the West and the world. But here's a paragraph from their plan so you'll know what they mean. By the way, I have to use my glasses. Wait until I get to heaven and have a talk with God. I do not know what he was thinking when he decided when I turned 50 I needed reading glasses. He must be a man. And he's going to hear it from me when I get to heaven. This paragraph is titled, Understanding the Role of the Muslim Brother in North America. The process of settlement, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about refugee resettlement in this plan because it plays a major role in their settlement process in dominating the world. And later I'm going to talk about the refugee situation in the United States. But I want you to pay attention to any time I mention the word settlement as I discuss this plan. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process, meaning a cultural jihadist process, with all the word means. The Ikhwan, which means the brothers, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and work whenever he is and wherever he lands, because remember we're talking about settlement, until the final hour comes and there is no escape from that destiny except for those who choose to slack. They continue, number five of this document talks about understanding that we cannot perform the settlement mission by ourselves or away from people. They need people to help them within different communities who are going to help them settle people in the different communities. People who are natives to that community or to that country. And here's a quote from that. A mission as significant and as huge as the settlement mission needs magnificent and exhausting efforts. In order to do that, we must possess a mastery of the art of, quote, coalitions, comma, the art of, quote, absorption, and the principles of cooperation. Number six, talks about the necessity of achieving a union and balanced gradual merger between private work and public work. And it says, it needs the time and the practical frame so that what is needed is achieved in a gradual and the balanced way that is compatible with the process of settlement. In other words, don't dump the refugees all at once. Bring them drip by drip over the years until we have mass numbers. By the way, for the reporters in the room, I'm quoting from document page, the government exhibit, number 003-0085, which was presented in the Holy Land Foundation trial in Dallas, Texas, in 2007 and 2008. This is page 7 of 18. And it's important for me to read facts to you because those of you who accuse you about being concerned about settlement and refugee resettlement, calling you hate mongers, they need to get their head out of the sand and understand what our enemy is plotting, especially as we know what their plan is. And I continue on page 8 of 18, and I'm not going to bore you, I'm not going to read you the whole document, I'm just touching high points, because I want you to understand the gravity of the problem that we are dealing with. Number 7 talks about the conviction that the success of the settlement of Islam and its movement in this country, meaning America, is a success to the global Islamic movement and a true support for the sought-after state, Allah willing. 
And I'm going to read you one line out of that paragraph. The success of the movement in America in establishing an observant Islamic base with power and effectiveness will be the best support and aid to the global movement project. Number eight, they talk about paragraph number eight, they talk about absorbing Muslims and winning them with all of their factions and colors in America and Canada for the settlement project and making it their cause, future, and the basis of their Islamic life in this part of the world. I only touched on high points because I'm not going to read to you the full document. Obviously, you can see this is many pages. This document is on our website, actforamerica.org. When you go home tonight, you can take your sweet time sitting and reading this document and forwarding it to everybody you know, your city council, who think you're nuts, your mayors, your people in charge in your community because they need to see this stuff. But the most important page about this document is the last page. Because the last page lists 29 front Islamic organizations set up in America by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to destroy our country from within by our own hands by deceiving us. And I'm going to read you a few of the names on this list. Number one on the list is ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. If their name is familiar to you, it's because they are advisors to President Obama about Middle East policy. It was actually the president of ISNA who wrote President Obama's speech, which he gave in the Arabic world. Remember the first famous speech he gave in, in Egypt to the Arabic world? The president of ISNA wrote it for him. So we not only have the fox watching the hen house, we have the fox inside the White House talking policy in the ear of the president. Number two on the list is the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. The Muslim Student Association has more chapters on American college campuses than the Democrats and the Republicans combined. And we wonder why we're losing our universities. Number eight on the list is Nate, the North American Islamic Trust. The North American Islamic Trust owns the deed to the majority of mosques, over 90% of mosques in the United States. Number 22 on the list is IAP, Islamic Association for Palestine, which later became CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. This is what we are dealing with. In this plan, they talk about every aspect and every area of our country which they want to infiltrate and impact. And you think your problem in Twin Falls is a little refugee issue that the town is dealing with. This is our problem in the United States. What you're looking at is the tip of the iceberg in your community. This is what we are dealing with. Remember, they wrote this plan for North America in 1991, 10 years prior to September 11th, prior to September 11th, while we were still asleep at the switch. They started this plan in 1991. In 2001, America was attacked. And then we had 2011. And here we are, 2016. They've been implementing this plan in the United States for the last 26 years while we are completely uninformed. How many of you knew about this plan? Raise your hand. Few people out of this full auditorium. And I'm sure you are people who watch the news, who are concerned about what's happening in our country. You are informed people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here tonight. And very few of you knew about the largest, the most important document presented in the largest terrorism trial ever in the history of the United States. And this brings me to the refugee issue. Why are we concerned about refugees? We are concerned about refugees because when you see what's happening in Europe, I shared with you what happened in Lebanon. When people hear about Lebanon, they think Lebanon is a Hezbollah country. They think actually Lebanon is an Islamic, Islamic country. Most people don't realize that Lebanon used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. 
Right now, and this happened in my lifetime. Right now, when people think of Lebanon, Lebanon is a terrorist hub controlled by Hezbollah. Today, when you're watching the news and you're watching about the money uh, laundering that Obama did with the Iranians, the $400 million out of our tax dollars, which he shipped to them uh, in, in the cover of the night, is basically now has gone to the terrorist organization Hezbollah in Lebanon to fund terrorism. What happened in Lebanon happened in Europe. Europe welcomed refugees. We see what's happening in Europe today. We see the rape. We see the drain on the financial system of the country. We see the crimes. We don't need imagination. We are watching it on the news. I'm sure you've heard about the knife attack in London this morning. I'm sure you heard about the bus bombing with Molotov cocktails by refugees yesterday in Paris. I'm sure you heard last week about the beheading of the priest um, at the church on Sunday morning. And I can go on and on and on. We do not need to imagine. We are seeing what the refugees are doing to Europe. The same thing is happening to America. And Obama is rushing refugees as far as fast as he can. So why are we concerned about refugees? And I'm not even talking terrorism. I'm going to share with you how refugees are coming to America and why we are concerned about refugees coming to America. You see, the United Nations decide what refugees come to America. Because the United Nations Commission of, on Refugees, the UN High Commission on Refugees, is under the influence of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is the Islamic bloc, Islamic countries that sit at the United Nations. Those are the same Islamic countries that help the Muslim Brotherhood write this plan and they are funding them. So they are responsible for what refugees come to America. So the refugees, so the United States works with our State Department in deciding what refugees come to the United States. The refugees then are taken from UN refugee camps in Europe. Now we know that the majority of refugee camps in Europe are filled with Muslims, not Christians. Why? Because Christians get raped, get abused, get sodomized, so when the Christians flee, and they are the true persecuted minority in the Middle East, Amen. they are running away from refugee camps because that's the last place they need to be. And they are trying to find other places, working hard and funding for themselves. They're not sitting in a refugee camp. So when the UN chooses the refugees to bring to America, almost all of them are Muslims. And they are coming from the majority four countries. They are coming from Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Syria. So the State Department then takes these refugees and they divide them among nine federal contractors. Six out of those nine federal contractors are charities, Christian and Jewish charities, who receive up to a billion dollars to resettle these refugees into the United States. And they're not passing the bucket on Sunday morning collecting the money or passing the bucket in the church, uh, in the synagogue on Saturday morning to collect the money. The money is paid by the United States Treasury out of our own tax dollars. It's a big cash cow that's pouring money into the pocket of these federal contractors. Then the refugees, after the federal contractors, takes the refugees, then the federal contractors, the nine federal contractors, work with 350 subcontractors divided in different communities across the United States. The refugees then are sent to 190 cities across the United States, like Twin Falls, Idaho. They have a wonderful, willing, somebody to help them, these independent subcontractors that are contracted with the nine federal contractors who are receiving money from the treasury. And they start helping that one person get resettled in whatever area. They work with them for six months. They give them benefits. By the way, the $1 billion cost doesn't even include health benefits, welfare, food stamps, none of that. That's all extra. So they work with one refugee for six months. And after that refugee is taken care of, because that's all the government will pay for, then that contractor in your community then starts doing the papers for the refugees to bring their extended family. Why? Because they get money per person. 
That's why they have a vested interest in bringing refugees. So when the churches look at you and say, oh, you're a Christian. Don't you have any compassion in your heart to bring these refugees? Don't buy that baloney. Because Christian charities, charities are lining their pockets with millions of dollars from the federal government to resettle these refugees. This is not just an operation, oh, we love them, let's take them in. This is an operation, the more refugees we bring in, the more money we put in our pockets from the federal government. And we need them to sustain us and sustain our growth. And by the way, it's not evangelical churches that are bringing these refugees. Evangelical churches has enough people in the pews to actually support the churches. It's Catholic charities, Presbyterian charities, Lutheran charities. It is those charities where they cannot fill their churches, so they need the money and the new people to get money to build their churches. That's who's getting paid this money from, from the federal government. So, why are we concerned about these refugees? They are resettling them in here. Um, uh, the refugees, after they are being resettled, and I'm not talking terrorism yet. I'm not going to touch on that yet. I'm going to talk about what it is costing our country to resettle refugees and what they are bringing with them. And I'm going to start with the diseases that they are bringing. Tuberculosis, for example. Tuberculosis was almost eradicated from the United States. Right now, tuberculosis is exploding in the United States brought by the refugees. And here are what's happening in different states. Colorado has 16 cases of refugees with tuberculosis. Ohio, 11 cases. Vermont, 35 cases. Wisconsin, 117 cases. And many of these cases are tuberculosis drug resistant, which means it costs $150,000 from, from our tax dollars to treat one patient, and it takes six to eight months to be able to treat the disease that's drug resistance. Florida, 11 cases. Idaho, 7 cases. Indiana, 4 cases. Kentucky, 9 cases. North Dakota, 4 cases. This is what's happening just in the diseases that they are bringing with them. Not to mention the cultural incompatibility. They're not compatible culturally with us. Sorry, I've been talking all day today. Not to mention how they are culturally incompatible with us and our way of life. We are importing people with a completely different value system that has no respect for women's rights, that has no respect for daughters, that has no respect for our values, for the way we live, for our culture, in any way, shape, or form. And I'm going to read you some of the cases. We heard about what's happening in Europe with the rapes, with the abuse, with the coddling, with the touching, with the probing, with the assault on women just walking down the street. As a matter of fact, well, obviously we heard about the, the rapes um, in Germany over New Year's Eve where the government and city council and the mayors tried to cover it because they did not want people not to like refugees because they wanted to bring more of them. They did not want to create panic in the community of what these so-called refugees that they brought in are doing. The same thing is happening in Belgium. The same thing is happening in France. Now, we in America don't have that many refugees yet. And hopefully we won't because we're, we're doing everything we can to stop Obama. But let me share with you from the little refugees we have, what cases we have already documented of Muslim refugees in this country and how they treat women. In Lowell, Massachusetts, a 13-year-old girl was twice groped at public pool by a 22-year-old freshly imported Syrian refugee. Leesburg, Virginia, West African refugee attempted to rape a college girl at her apartment complex behind the garbage dump. Roanoke, Virginia, four refugees were indicted for planning to kidnap and hold local rich women for ransom. Utah, a Burmese Muslim in U.S. for one month brutally murdered a seven-year-old Christian girl. In El Cajon, California, a Muslim man killed his wife in honor killing and then blamed it on Islamophobia, trying to accuse, you know, people that look like you all of Islamophobia, they killed her. Mapleton, North Dakota, a Somali refugee beat and raped a North Dakotan woman shouting Allahu Akbar. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, a roving gang of Somali men threatened to attack and rape women in an upscale neighborhood. 
Twin Falls, Idaho, a five-year-old girl was violated. And I'm going to use the term violated because a lot of people are uncomfortable with rape. No matter what you call it, sexually assaulted by three boys from Iraq and Sudan, important less than two years ago. What we are seeing here today is we are seeing a pattern of disrespect towards women, towards daughters, towards females in general. Today, it's some women you do not know. It's some Muslim girl, it's some Christian refugee girl. Next, it'll be your wife, your daughter, your girlfriend, your mother. Just look at Europe. We cannot say we lack imagination. We can no longer bury our head in the sand. The writing is on the wall. We must wake up and listen and see what's happening around us. We are dealing with a disease that is infiltrating our country and is going to ruin our country unless we get it out or treat it immediately. Amen. And this is what's happening. And in Twin Falls, Idaho, shame on those who are covering up what happened to this little year old girl. You should be ashamed of yourself. Those who are selling their integrity for dollars, shame on you. And I hope that every single one of you, when you go vote next election, get every single one of them out of office, throw them on the streets and elect somebody else. Our founding fathers are rolling in their grave to see the spineless, corrupt, morally bankrupt leaders we have in this country right now. George Washington is spitting in his grave. This is not the America that's our America. This is not the community and the leaders we expect. We have higher standards. America has higher standards. We have always led in the world. America has always been a beacon of light to the world, of justice, of freedom, standing up for people, standing up for human rights. Our soldiers go and lay their life on the line to protect the freedoms of others. The least we can do is protect the freedoms of those in our country. And I believe we need to take political correctness and throw it in the garbage where it belongs and start calling Spain Spain. And those cowards who try to shame you, your leaders who try to shame you and tell you you are haters and you are not loving, you tell them if you want love and compassion towards these refugees, build settlement for them where they are, next to their homeland. So when their war ends, they can go back home and they can continue their life over there. And those who don't like America, who don't approve of America, I am sick and tired of hearing people complain about America and see only the ills in America. For those who cannot stop talking bad, bad mouthing America, I say we give them a one way ticket to get the hell out of this country and back to whatever hell hole they came from. And I am sick and tired when I hear people say, I'm an African American, and I'm a Lebanese American, and I'm a Mexican American, and I'm a Vietnamese American. I am nothing but an American. And while I'm on a roll, I believe English is the official language of the United States and shall remain so. Borders, language, country. 
That's what made America great. Those who came to America before wanted to be a part of the American fabric, wanted to be American. We cannot apologize for being patriotic and wanting to protect America. I am unapologetically patriotic. I want to protect my country, and I know so do you. This is why we come together and speak up with authority to protect the nation. We want people to come here. We want people to come here legally, like I came here legally. Those are the type of immigrants you want in your country. We do not want people who are coming here, bringing diseases with them, bringing a different set of values, do not want to assimilate. When you look across the globe, of all the people that have become refugees, all the people, whether it's Jews, Japanese, Chinese, whatever, not one group, religious or otherwise, have ever tried to enforce their religious practices and their traditions on their host country. Yeah. Right now, only the Muslims, no matter where they are immigrating, whether it's Australia or Canada or France or Germany or America, they are the only ones who are demanding that their host countries adopt to them, that American companies institute five, time, five times prayer times during the work day so they can go pray. You know what? I come from the Middle East. Never once in my life in the Middle East, and by the way, I left the Middle East and came to the States in 2000, and I was 24 years old. Never once in my life did I see a prayer room in any company, did I see ever a foot washing basin, at any school, at any airport, at any public buildings. So if Muslims did not need them in the Middle East, which is the cradle of Islam, why do they need them in the United States? But I didn't come here tonight to only share with you problems. I came here tonight to also inspire you, to also empower you, to also give you information that your ignoramus leaders do not even know, a basic information that every single elected official should know about and know why we need to protect our country. Tonight you are more informed than the leaders you have in your city, in your state, and in our country. And this is why we need to come together and we need to work together. September 11th was a defining moment for the United States. September 11th changed our lives. We all did the same thing the next day. We all sat in front of our TV screen, glued to our TV screen, brokenhearted, watching the images of the World Trade Center come down again and again and again, and wondering how can people hate us so much that they would do this to us. We all did the same thing. We felt helpless. We felt frustrated. We felt brokenhearted. We could not believe that people would do this to us. September 11th was a defining moment for America. But it was especially a defining moment for me. You see, my two daughters came home that day from school. And my youngest daughter was around my age when I was wounded in Lebanon. And she looked at me as we were watching television and she said to me, Mommy, why did they do this to us? And I looked at her and I told her, they hate us because they consider us infidels and they want to kill us. Here we were. I had to repeat to my daughter exactly what my daddy said to me back when I was a child in Lebanon. Here we were, two generations apart. I was a young Lebanese girl who spoke Arabic. She's a young American girl who speaks English. 8,000 miles apart, two different continents, 30 years apart. I had to look into my daughter's eyes and repeat to her exactly what my daddy said to me. That day was my defining moment. That day is the day I vowed that I will do everything I can to make sure that my daughter will never ever have to look into her child's eyes and repeat to him or to her what my daddy said to me and what I had to say to her. That day I was reborn as an activist. Wow. I sat around, September 11th happened on a Tuesday morning. Until Sunday, I laid on our family couch, wondering and thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I cannot have this war follow me here. I cannot have my children be threatened by the same thing I lived under with my childhood. 
And I decided I'm going to start a nonprofit organization and I'm going to travel and speak about the threat of radical Islam to world peace and our national security. And in 2002, I founded ACT because I wanted people to, go, to act, to do something for the country. And I started educating people and I started traveling and speaking to groups as small as eight people meeting at Frankie's Ribs on a Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. in the snow. And I'm thinking, who meets at 7 a.m. in the morning in the snow? to groups as large as 10,000 people sitting in some of these mega churches. And one question kept coming up, now that I'm informed, what can I do? Give me something to do. And I learned a very important lesson, that while education is important, education by itself is not sufficient. Education must be coupled with action. And that's when I launched Act for America, our lobbying arm in 2007. And I'm proud to tell you that Act for America today is the largest national security grassroots organization in the country with 300,000 members and over 1,000 chapters nationwide. We are the NRA of national security and growing. And I want to give a shout out tonight to Julie, our chapter leader. Julie, where are you? Who made this possible tonight with the help of all the other wonderful organizations that worked with her. Where's Julie? You'll see her later. Shout out to Julie. She's probably running around. But it took a citizen activist. Here's Julie. Come, come, come. They've got to see you. They've got to see you. This is the lady that made it possible for me to come here tonight. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. That's what patriotism is all about. People ask, what can I do? You know, as John Kennedy said, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Tonight is about what we, each one of us, can do for the country. Act for America today is keeping a watchful eye over all the country, every state. This is why I can rattle what's happening to you in these states, whether in rape or sexual assault made by refugees, whether in tuberculosis cases or everything else. So while you think you are in isolated situation in Twin Falls, Idaho, I am here to tell you that you're not alone because Act for America is going to help you like Act for America is helping everybody nationwide stand up and defend their community. We're going to take your voice and magnify it hundreds of thousands of times nationwide. You are not alone in this fight. And I hope by the time we leave here today, all of us will be part of Act for America. I'm glad to tell you that last year we launched our refugee resettlement working group. These are concerned citizens just like you who are concerned about the type of refugees that are being brought into the country. And I urge you tonight to sign up to join our refugee resettlement working group so you can keep a watchful eye on your, on your state and what's happening. Right now we are monitoring what's happening in different states and we are actually putting pressure on our government and uh, getting a Freedom of Information Act so we can find out when these secret meetings are happening in your state and in other states because the whole refugee program is in, all in secrecy because they do not want people showing up when they are deciding how many they're going to bring to your community. It's a hush-hush under the table. By the time you wake up, the refugees are already there in your city. So right now, we are mobilizing citizens nationwide by alerting them as to when these meetings are happening, what questions they need to ask, what time they are happening, show up in there and put pressure on your elected officials not to bring the refugees. And I'm proud to tell you that we already passed resolutions, two resolutions in North Carolina and in South Carolina, allowing the states to block refugees coming into their states. They passed resolutions to block it. I'm also proud to tell you that we are working in Congress. We already have a bill presented by Congressman Babin that already has over 95 co-sponsors. We've been working very hard getting co-sponsors to stop Obama from bringing refugees into the country. We are also working on a parallel bill in the Senate as well. And we are hoping that by the time we have a president next year, 
that our next president, he will be so strong that he will be able to put a complete stop to this baloney and make America great again. See, this is what I love about America. You are my people. America is a country made for the people, by the people. We, the people, hold the power over our elected officials if we just know what to do. And tonight, I'm going to teach you what to do. You know, a lot of people say, what is my voice going to count? I'm only one person. My elected official, need to, my senator, my congressman, he needs to hear from 40,000 people before he even listens. Why, why even bother make a phone call? Well, I've got news for you. I talk to elected officials all the time and I ask them, how many people do you need to hear from to make an issue your top priority? And you'll be shocked at the answer. 40 to 50 people. That's it. And here's the science behind the numbers. They believe that every email or a phone call or a letter, a representative of 1,000 couch potatoes who are too lazy to make a phone call or write a letter, yet they vote on election day. That translates to 40 to 50,000 voters on election day. Look how many people we have here today. Look at the power you have. We have more than 40 people here. Can you imagine if every single one of you pick up the phone and call your elected official about the refugee issue and tell him or her we're going to get your behind out of that office in Washington, D.C. unless you vote to protect the state? Don't you think you hold some clout? Of course you do. That's what Act for America does. We empower our citizens. So tonight, under your seat, when you came in, there are two papers. They put them under the seat, right? Because if this message resonates with you today, I'm going to show you how we're all going to work together, and I hope you will join me in working together to securing our nation. And under your seats, there are two papers, and I hope we have enough light for everybody to see. The top paper says, Action Card. Now, if my message resonated with you and you would like to receive our free emails and action alerts so you can be notified when there is a bill coming down for a vote, like Congressman Babin's bills about refugees or any bill in your state, we need to be able to reach you. So we want you to sign up to receive our emails and action alerts. How many of you here are receiving our emails and action alerts? Raise your hand. Not many. The rest of you who are not receiving our emails, if you feel you learned something new tonight that you will benefit from learning going forward and sharing it with your friends, you need to be signed up to our emails. Please check this box and write your name. Please print legibly. Now, that's very important. Now, everybody starts writing. Everybody has a pen? If you don't have a pen, borrow a pen from your neighbor. If you cannot find a neighbor with a pen, prick your finger with blood, write it, I don't care. <laughs> Just write it. This is, this is called grassroots at its best. Receive Act for America email, check that box. Now, if you say, Brigitte, I am so fired up tonight. I agree with everything you said. I'm going to take my city back. I'm going to take my state back. I'm going to bring back the America that I know that I grew up in and I want to work with you to make this happen and I want to join a chapter, join our chapter, check this box. We have an amazing chapter right here. Julie is our chapter leader who walked up here, who's the reason behind me being here today. Join us. Join our chapter. If you drove here from somewhere far away and you don't live in Twin Falls, if there's no chapter near you, please start the chapter. We will train you. We will assign you a member. We will turn over the names to you of people who are close to you so you can get your chapter going. You'll be working with Julie. If, if you want to start the chapter, please check that box. So make sure you check. Receive free Act for America emails. Join a chapter or start a chapter. And please write your name legibly, print your email, your number, so we can reach you, especially those of you who want to be, join Act for America and especially want to be a part of the, of the chapter, become a chapter leader. Now, 
Once you're done writing this, I want you to raise your paper because our volunteers and ushers are going to come to the aisles and pick these papers from you. I'm going to carry these papers with me in my bag straight to my office, enter your data in our computers. Only one person has access to that data and then the papers are shredded. I take your security as important as I take my security. So please fill these papers. Those of you who are not getting our emails and action alerts, and this message resonates with you and you want to be involved, please fill this paper and pass it to the center of the aisle. Doesn't cost you a dime. We want you involved. We want you engaged. We talk about all the changes in our country. There comes a point at which we have to say, we're going to make sure that the enemy does not conquer us from within. Islamic ideology, the threat that it poses here to us here in America. It's something that every American that's patriotic should be aware of. But are you wanting to do something about it? Are you just emailing? Are you just talking about it in your Sunday school classes? America is the greatest nation on earth. This is a nation built for the people, by the people. We have a responsibility. You are standing at the crossroads of history. Act for America today is truly a conference that's trying to educate the community. It's an opportunity for us to hear great speakers. It's an opportunity for us to get great information. Act for America is, is really about giving people the, the tools and the resources to know what the enemy is, know what uh, we're up against. We're going to Capitol Hill to meet with our uh, legislators, senators, hear a legislative briefing. My reasons for coming here is that I meet congressmen up on Capitol Hill. I hope to just let them see my face and know that I am a voice and I am an activist. Act for America has passed 42 bills in 22 states to protect America. What can we do? What can we do as law-abiding citizens? You have a heavy charge, we all do. It starts here with the Special Forces. Don't take lightly what you are doing. I can share what I learned, but it's not the same as being here. The whole atmosphere is electric. If you're down, you'll be pulled up again, and that's what's so great about this conference. This organization is about the idea that it's okay to be who you are as long as you do not compromise the rights and the freedoms of others. And it empowers us to go back to our own states and take action. We represent other people too, and so it's important to convey that message out to whoever our congressman is. We need to be networked, we need to be active, we need to be vocal. The honor today is actually mine to work with and meet with amazing patriots like you. I was able to bring together patriots who love this country as much as I do, who travel across the country to make sure that we preserve our nation the way we got it from them and the way we're going to hand it to our future generations. Home of the brave, that's what we are. Land of the free. Those words mean something when you sing that in the national anthem. It means you need to get involved with this kind of activity. And before I end, I want all our veterans and our retired military and active military to please stand up and be recognized. I have a message for you. And remain standing after the applause. All of our veterans and our military personnel, I have a message for you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for building a nation for me where I can come and be all I can be as a citizen, as an American.
I want to thank you for my freedom. I want to thank you for every freedom I have. My freedom of speech, my freedom of religion, my freedom of expression, and every other freedom I have. I know that my freedom is built upon your shoulders and your sacrifice. You are not only my heroes, you are the heroes of millions of Americans who are unable to stand here before you tonight, I thank you. On their behalf, I thank you. I thank you on behalf of millions of people across the globe who are still living under tyranny, who never will have the ability to look you in the eyes and say thank you for standing up for freedom around the world. On their behalf, I thank you. I thank you for every meal you missed. I thank you for every vacation you missed. I thank you for every family occasion you missed serving our country so we can enjoy being with our families and celebrating our holidays. And I vow to you that I am building an organization with Act for America that will always honor you, that will always praise you, that will always sing of your sacrifice, that will always teach our new generation just where their freedom comes from. May God bless you one and all. May God bless the United States of America. I am so honored to be here tonight. God bless you and I look forward to seeing you at the end. Thank you all for being here.